the moment. Our fellow geeks, dweebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your host. Jeff Nerf Herder Chandler and Jim Kaiju Baker. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. go this is a mystery to me but we are close to our hundredth episode here wow so that is crazy thank you for everybody that listens on yes. a weekly basis and, and uh for those of you who may have found us on our new platform yes we can actually announce this now pandora that's crazy that's uh that's a huge thing for us we're now on pandora yeah. Yes, and I would like to give a shout out as well as we're as we're self promoting at this junction in the show. Conjunction. Um, I would like to give a shout out to New Paltz Cinemas for actually putting up our ad as promised. You well, you paid it. them, right? <laughs> uh, well, I paid them, but it's good to see that my money went somewhere. So, there you go. <laughs> so now we're we, actually up yes. there now. So if you do check us out, you see you see that ad, let us know. Yeah, at the New Paltz Cinema only, exclusively, our ad runs at the New Paltz Cinemas. Yeah, well, we can't we can't go national yet. We're not getting there. Quite. Yeah, baby, we're not like baby we're... steps. Listen, baby steps. Yeah, right? yeah. Jack Hammer had to start somewhere as well, right? Oh, Jack. Speaking of Jack Hammer, Jack Hammer wants to go to the movies with us. Really? <laughs> yeah. I said if the three of us went to the theater at the same time, it would be like mystery science theater. It, it would. would just it would be chaos. We would be asked to leave to, unless to, we had a private screening. That is the only way that would right. ever go down. But that would be a hoot and a holler. Yeah, because Jeff, you and I have never seen a movie together. No, we think. never have. No, it's we're like those two girls separate. in that Coke commercial that just text each other while they're watching a the movie simultaneously. Yep. Great FX. Great. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Next time let's watch it together. <laughs> there are two theaters across the street from each other. Ay, yeah, yeah. So, yes. Wait, what are we talking about this week? We are talking about Knives Out. Ah, yes. The Ryan Johnson movie. I thought it was yeah. Rian. Rian. Rian Johnson, yeah. Ryan. Brian. Yeah, Ryan. It's just, it's Brian without a B. It's Ryan Johnson. So now the big question is, will he be able to redeem himself <clears throat> after I think... letting down so many Star Wars fans around the globe with The Last Jedi? No, I think this guy's got an albatross around his neck. It doesn't matter what he does. This could be the best movie, greatest movie in the world. And you're still going to have your distractors that don't want to do it. They right. don't want to give this guy a dime because he destroyed Star Wars. For them. Now, Jeff, as you often say, nobody sets out to make a bad movie. Correct. And The Last Jedi is not you know, your textbook definition of a bad movie. It is an no. enjoyable ride to watch. Yes. And I enjoyed it while I was sitting in the theater watching it. But after that initial rush, because as we said, our, the movie theater is our happy place. So pretty much any movie I go to see in a theater, I will enjoy to some extent. Yes. The Last Jedi is one of those movies where after you watch it and it sinks in, then you kind of are disappointed with the choices that are made in the storytelling. Well, the fanboy expectations are all over the place. Unfortunately, by the time this movie came out, you know, we've, we've talked about this before, which was, yeah, you know, you... you you want to see Luke Skywalker in his heyday, and you don't get it. I mean, Mark Hamill's come out and lambasted the fact that he didn't like the direction that this character was taken. But you can't put all this blame on Johnson. He wrote it, but somebody approved it, and someone said, this is great, let's move forward. Yeah, it is not made in a vacuum. There's no, a million no. people, I'm sure, had their hands in this story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, from Kathleen Kennedy to the top of Disney, Iger, they're all culpable. <laughs> it's, I don't I, listen. It is what it is. I guy, Rusty the bailiff and Judge Wapner will all see them <laughs> in the People's Court. There you go. But the, some of these people who the, the vitriol uh, attacking this guy online is just silly. Get a life. Come on. Whatever. Uh, I don't have any news. If you want to talk news, I don't know if no, you have anything. No. I do have one question though, which was in your screening of Knives Out. Did you see? a preview for the new Harrison Ford movie. No. You see, in New Paltz, I do not get 
the 10 previews that you normally do okay. in the megaplex i only get one and i don't even remember what that okay. was okay yeah that, well in regal you get about 85 so it's a little too much apparently they're making little women again and emma so everything old is new harrison ford is in the new call of the wild and it looks intriguing i, I can't even really talk about it now but the main character is a dog next to him it's cg it's not a real dog what? So there's scenes where this dog is making almost like Scooby-Doo faces. And I'm just I'm like, are you kidding me? Because the movie looks epic in its scale, but the dog is not real. And you can tell it's not real. And I'm like, you can't get a real dog on set. It's not like it's a lion Lassie, or a tiger, Lassie carried right? a show, a TV show for years. Dogs are movie stars. A real dog could do Rin that. Rin Tin Damn straight. I don't know. It's whatever. So, is so this that, a kids movie? Is it a comedy? Well, Call of the Wild. It's a Jack. It's based it's on Jack, Jack London. But Jack it, London. It's yeah. a very famous book. It's been re, it's been made as a movie before. But I mean, is um, this geared towards <clears throat> kids? Is this why that the dog is CG? Uh, what what is the feel of this trailer? It's uh, I thought it was a much more like epic man against nature kind of a thing. But it looks like the dog is uh, meant almost for comic relief. So maybe it is a kid-driven movie, which, by the way, I had a lot of kids in my screening of Knives Out. Really? I had a lady with at least five kids next to me. So you um, see, this was not like Jojo Rabbit for you. You were able to use your Regal app, and it was yes, readily correct. available to you yes, in Regal. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yep, this was, this was uh, right there, and I was able to walk in. But before we get into Knives Out, I do have to bring up last week's episode, and I want to apologize. I was not too kind to 1941. And I know that you love yes. this movie. Yes. Okay. And I know that you took it to heart that I did not like it. But last night, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom was on. Now, we've all seen this movie a hundred times, but to sit from the beginning of it, I can't tell you the last time I watched it straight through. That opening sequence in Shanghai with Willie dancing and singing and there's a big choreographed fight. The anything that, goes number. The anything right? goes number. That does not happen without Spielberg's experience on 1941. So I do have to give credit to 1941 that he went through that in order to get to that point. Uh, and to the point where at the end of that scene, Dan Aykroyd has a cameo. Did you know that? Like Dan a speaking, Aykroyd. A speaking part, right? Yeah. Is he like the restaurant manager or something? No, at the end when, when, they, when they get onto uh, Lau's plane, an escape he's the he's the guy who drives the jeep and gets okay, them onto I, the plane i think i do remember that it's been he a while like two, since he's I got like two that, lines yeah. of dialogue and you really don't see an up close shot of him but it is dan Aykroyd, who obviously was in 1941 yes i mean so you there's are a, there's a legacy you are conceding that there is some merit to this movie there is i i am yes okay so if it makes you feel better at night that yes, I maybe another five years I watch it again. Maybe I'll appreciate it a little bit more. And maybe you'll give it some Ed McMahon style laughing as well. And oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so knives out. Knives out. So what we're trying to do with this episode is kind of bring a little mystery into our lives with TMI. So we thought, what better to match knives out with but the classic Neil Simon. Murder by Death. So we wanted to give a whodunit flavor to this entire episode. Uh, and I think we did a damn good job of pairing these two up. Oh, yeah. A according to all the stuff that I read surrounding Knives Out, Murder by Death was one of the specific films that influenced Ryan Johnson oh, in really? writing and directing. Oh, Knives that's Out. interesting. Yes. Uh, because I'm seeing a lot of reviews where people are dismissing this as a poor man's clue. And my answer to that is, clue is a poor man's death by yeah, murder. Yeah, clue is no big shakes, believe right, me. Right, correct. I'm going to hurt my arm patting myself on the back. So now you're saying that there were a lot of kids in your audience. I did have a lot of kids to the point where I'm like, am I in the right theater? Because it does seem like a weird, and I think it's the Chris Evan connection. Captain America. Captain America. I want to go see that Captain America movie. Well, now, Captain are these America. kids by, in groups by themselves or with parents? No, there was a mom next to me that probably had about five kids with her. And they enjoyed the hell out of this movie. They, <laughs> they were laughing. But... Have you seen, I think it's Xfinity, has a commercial now where they bring Henry Thomas and E.T. back together? Yes, I saw it during the Thanksgiving okay. Day Parade. Okay, well, it aired on my screen, and these kids lost their freaking mind thinking that it was a sequel. You know what's funny is when it came on, I thought to myself, hey, that looks like Jack Torrance from uh, Dr. Sleep. <laughs> it was a weird choice for to take your kid, especially when Frozen 2 had just come out, but they were all boys. 
So most boys don't want to go see. Yeah. Now in my theater, now mind you, this is where I saw our ad run for the first time. Right. So I'm looking before the the ads even start. I'm looking around to see because I know our ad's going to come up. And I'm like, is this our demographic? And it was all older people. Probably ninety percent were fifty, fifty five okay. plus aged. Sure enough, it's a it was a loud, chattery audience before the movie started. Nobody paid attention to our ad when it right. when it came up. <laughs> Did you did you go, hey, look at that? <laughs> too, I was trying to take a picture of the thing That's as you funny. know, because I didn't know exactly when it was going to come gonna up. So I had up. the phone up the whole time. There were a couple of kids, maybe two, and then like 12 year old boys with parents. Yeah. And I can only assume that they were there for the Chris Evans connection. Now, let me bring this up. And this kind of upset me during the course of uh -oh. watching Knives Out. Three girls. There was a big group that sat down right in the row in front of us. It was all mid-20s, three girls, two guys. And it looked like maybe there was one couple amongst all five of them. And now the girls all sat together and then the guys sat next to them on their, you know, on their own. So it was two factions set up. The guys didn't say anything during the movie, but the girls, every time oh, Chris Evans Jerry, came on, um, oh, he is so hot. <laughs> He is so hot. Oh, oh, Marta, that's right. Get in the car with him. Oh, God. I was offended by this, listening to this. <laughs> Meanwhile, that's what you say whenever you're watching The Mandalorian. Oh, cute Yoda. Oh, cute Yoda. But Get no, in the ship with him. It, Get in the ship with him. Think of it this way. Say if we're watching, even if it was The Fog with Adrian Barbeau, and you right, and I correct. are sitting there, right? Oh. And you lean over like Homer Simpson. Oh, she is so hot. Yeah, no, so we can't. Hot. Well, but like, why should that they be any different? Why? That's you true. Know, that's true. Sexism. Respect you. Respect your surroundings. Sexism you know, goes both ways. Keep your feelings to yourself. Oh, I don't care. Seven. I was saying the same thing though, because <laughs> he is dreamy, and he plays a complete and utter a hole. He does, and he I, does he's it more so Johnny, well. He's more Johnny Storm in this than definitely Captain America, but he he nailed it. I loved him. So this is pretty much your classic whodunit setup. The grandfather, the patriarch of the family here, the Thromby family, Thromby. played by Christopher Plummer, yeah. famously of uh, Captain, Sound of Cap Music. Captain Von Trapp? Yeah. Harlan Thromby. So he is a mystery writer. Um, a very well-to-do mystery writer. Yes. Made millions and has several bestsellers to his name. So his family has reaped the spoils of his books and all are kind of indebted to him in one way or other. So we've got this family gathering at this wonderful looking mansion. Oh, it's beautiful. The set, the set on this is unbelievable. From, you know, and you could tell it was in the Northeast in the U S somehow because it's the, the movie takes place during the fall, early winter. Uh, Cause you get those crisp leaves. Vermont or Maine maybe. So I looked into it. It's actually, it's the mansion is from Massachusetts. So that's where they filmed it. That was, it was close. close. Close, close. New England, right? There you go. So they all gather here and he ends up dead. Throat slit the next morning after this family reunion party. Enter the character of Benoit Blanc, played by Daniel Craig. And can I tell you, Friggin' the uh, Chris Evans character Ransom stole my best line at the end of the movie because he refers to him as Foghorn Leghorn, <laughs> and that's exactly what he's doing. I say, I say, boy, I got gotcha. to put him. Yeah, it, it just this this over the top Southern drawl accents. Uh, he was just chewing up the scenery with this. So he's a private investigator. So he's there at someone's behest that we don't know. So he doesn't know. No, he doesn't even know. But he's a private investigator of world renown. So he's almost like a Sherlock Holmes type right, character. Correct. You see the murder right up front that he's dead. This is the great thing about this. It's almost like a whodunit in reverse. You know yes. who killed him 10 minutes into the movie. Yeah, I thought that was unravels. really wild that you, it doesn't take very long to figure out exactly what happened. But then, you know, the police are there and every, you see the, the story unfold from different points of view of the family members and everyone's got something different and they're all ready to just unload on each other. Yeah. So you're like, all right, well, we know who did it. <laughs> <laughs> How it happens. But there's, you know, there's two hours left. So there's got to be yeah. some kind of twist there's, as to how uh, she did it. There's a, there's a lot of layers to peel back on this. So now um, let's bring this up right now. We spoil these movies. So oh yeah. Oh if yeah. you want to see Knives Out and you don't want to be spoiled, the, and it's, yeah. a, it's a movie going experience in itself. So yeah. I implore you to stop listening right now. Go see this movie and come back after you've seen it. Two yes, weeks. please explain it to me. <laughs> 
<laughs> it does get convoluted. It does. We're, we're introduced to the Thromby family and um, also to Harlan Thromby's nurse who his comes aid, over right? on a daily basis to give him his, his meds and to provide companionship. Marta. Platonic companionship, I may add. Yeah, because she's young. She is. Now, played by Anna de Armas, who was in our Blade Runner reboot not too long ago. Oh. She was the vision that Ryan, from the, from the billboard, the girl from the billboard yes, in yes. Blade Runner. But after the first, what, 20 minutes, it, it's her movie. So that was that was an interesting twist in and of itself that the, all these other big name actors suddenly become uh, second fiddle to, to, her, to her story. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. The story revolves around her. Yes, and she's got the most screen time as well. So this is again a whodunit, and it's right from the get go. Christopher Plummer's body is discovered. Harlan has apparently killed himself, slit his own throat in his yep. attic study. And the next day, the police arrive. Well, actually, it's after the funeral, the police arrive. Yeah. And they're questioning all these family members who each, it turns out, would have their own individual motive for killing him, as right. you would have in any good mystery. Right, so, correct. Here's what throws you. You're told, as this is going on, as you're learning that each of these people have their own motives, that none of them have killed him. Right. You're told <laughs> immediately what actually happened. Marta arrives at the house. After this family reunion party has gone awry, he's had arguments Harlan has with every single one of his every family, family member. Yep. They go up into his attic study and she's going to give him his pain medication. She usually follows that up with a little hit of morphine to help him go to sleep. So he's setting up a game of go with her as he normally does. She's giving him his meds and suddenly she realizes that she's given him the wrong meds. Right. Of what she normally gives him 100 milligrams of because they've been talking and she's not been really paying attention. She sees that she's given him 100 milligrams of morphine rather than the three that she normally gives him afterwards. So now this, he's got like 10 minutes. He's complaining about his family and they're going through the what's Right, and he had party. made a decision that night that you know none of them were happy with or whatever. And that's where all the fights generated from. And she's like frantic. She wants to call an ambulance. And he's just kind of like, you know what? I'm cool with this. Because she let tells this happen. him, that she tells him, she's he's got ten minutes to live right. now. Now that she's given him hundred milligrams of but, more, but he's but he's a murder mystery writer. So now he's like in his brain, he's like, here's how you're gonna get out of this. And so he's now counting down the minutes in his yeah. head. That he's she's got six minutes left. This is what she needs to do. And he's to, to actually telling herself. her, wait a second, if you call an ambulance, they'll never be here in time. Right. So I'm gonna die anyway. Yep. So, but if you call an ambulance, they'll know what you did. So right. you're not going to call the ambulance. And yes, he goes through the steps, what specifically she needs to do to get away with his murder, because he's already forgiven her for it. Right. He's come to peace. He's 85. It was, it was 85th birthday party. That's what the whole thing was. So. And here's the other thing. She has the antidote, for lack of a better term, to but this morphine injection, and right. it's not in her bag. She carries it with her everywhere, yep. along yep. with the morphine, but for some reason... It's not, not there. in her back. He sends her out, tells her exactly what she needs to do, how to sneak out of the house. And as she's fighting him to go, he just lays on the couch and slits his own throat. To make it look like a suicide. Make it look like a suicide. So now she's in a panic. He's told her to drive past the cameras, to park her car once she's out of range of the cameras, like to get out of the car and sneak back in the house by climbing up the trellis back into his room. And I'm not sure what she was I'm going to remember. Well, for. well, he was trying to establish when she left the house to make sure that she muttered the time to acknowledge that she was leaving the house at a certain time. And then she was sneaking back into the house and she put his robe and had on like he was coming back downstairs for a midnight snack yes because he wanted the family to see that he was, he still, was still alive, alive. after she left right so that way the, the time of death would not match up with when she left so that's why she came back to the house yeah. then she had but, to climb back down the trellis after establishing that right and that's when the old ancient grandmother in her Grand, wheelchair sees yeah. her climbing down but mistakes her for chris evans oh, right, ransom. ransom she's yeah but uh, but this is all kind of unfolding you're starting to, because the, the police are interrogating each one of the family members and you're starting to hear their stories and you see their side of what's going on during that that birthday party and why they were fighting with him at certain points so all of these little things are starting to weave together to kind of build this bigger picture and like you said um yeah, it becomes obvious that they all have motives to, yeah. <laughs> to maybe want to take this guy out. Jamie Lee Curtis, her character, that's his daughter, right? That's his eldest daughter, and her right. husband is played by Don Johnson. And can uh, I Richard. just say, 
as a huge Miami Vice junkie, it is so nice to see Don Johnson back on screen. Like we just talk is, about Carl Weathers or, you know, in uh, the Mandalorian, but Don Johnson, where have you been? Yep. And he plays that guy that you're probably going to fight with on Thanksgiving day with that member of your family. Oh, yeah, that oh, probably is going to start the fight on Thanksgiving was Mr. day. Mr. Right wing. Uh, yeah. 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 That was uh, interesting. But Jamie Lee Curtis, like she had, what kind of empire did she have going there? She had some kind of a business. Well, she made it sound like she did on her own and all these other ones were just, you know, sucking at his teeth, but find out later that he had given her like a million dollars as a startup. So you know that Don Johnson has motive because the grandfather has figured out that he's been cheating on his daughter and he threatens to tell his daughter. So that's right there. You get Don Johnson's motive for killing him. You get Michael Shannon, who plays Walter, who is his youngest son who runs his publishing company. And he's been trying to talk his father for years into selling film rights and TV rights for his right. stories. Yep. And he, and he refuses it. flatly to make a movie or a TV show out of one of his books. Yep. And he is so uh, tired of hearing this from his son that he fires his son that <laughs> night. He's like, you know what? I'm going to make this easy on you. You don't have to worry about my publishing empire anymore. <laughs> you need to go out and make something of your own. And the kid was just like, what? What? Yeah. Are you firing me? He goes, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Yeah. He's like, we're going to talk about it now. So then, so he's got motive for killing yep. his father. Right. And then I think you were just mentioning, you bringing up Joni. Oh, yep. Tony Collette. Played by Tony Collette, who runs kind of like a Gwyneth Paltrow goop type company of her own beauty products and stuff yeah, that she's right. also started because of her father-in-law's money. But she, he's also paying off the daughter's uh, college. Yeah, Tony he Collette's writes, daughter, Meg, his granddaughter, yep. he's writing yep. a check for her every semester to pay but for her But he finds tuition. out that she's double dipping, that she's getting two checks and been stealing from him. So he cut her off completely. Right. So there's kind of a motive on that end. So he's already angered three of these family members before the party even starts. They all say, as they're being interviewed, of course, in any good murder mystery, oh no, nothing out of the ordinary happens. Right, and then the flashback, in, yeah. right. <laughs> and it flashes back to these, these conversations. Uh, and we didn't talk about, so Chris Evans' character, who is the one who gets up and storms out first? Yeah, his name so, is Hugh. What's his full name? Hugh Ransom. Ransom yeah. is what they the call Ransom's him. Ransom is what they call him. So he is Don Johnson and Jamie Lee Curtis's son. Yeah. So Harlan is his grandfather. So they have a knockdown drag out. You learn a little bit later that he's been cut out of his grandfather's will. Altogether. He's such a yeah. douchebag. <laughs> so yeah, so everybody has reason for killing this old man. But you learn this after you already know. That Marta has killed right, him. Right, correct. Uh, so we're weaving th- all these stories through because of interviews that they're having with Blanc and these two police officers that are assisting him. Blanc is trying to figure out who's killed the old man, but doesn't realize that Marta is actually the one to do it. So he's enlisted Marta's help, partly because she cannot tell a lie, literally. Which is an interesting, I guess this is a, a real condition. That... So it's not like her nose grows when she right. tells a lie. <laughs> She's not a Pinocchio. She's not Pinocchio, but she vomits. So she has a physical inability to lie. To lie, which so, is interesting. Because if she does, then she gets physically ill immediately. Right. So he knows when she's telling the truth and when she's not. He enlists her to help him with, this, it... with the family because she knows them best. Right. And, and the family's all gone to the bat for her that, you know, she is a member of the family, that she has been there for, for, the, for the father and that she is loving and to be trusted. So, uh, But yet yeah. nobody's invited her to the funeral. They all say I was outvoted, but yeah, every right. single no, one of yep. them says yep. I was outvoted. Yep. Was and none funny, of them seem to know where joke. she's from. No, that's a running joke as well, which is every time they mention her, her country of origin, it changes whether it's Uruguay or she's... <laughs> or Brazil or Brazil, wherever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we do find out that uh, her mother is uh, here illegally and that she's been working for this family. So the movie from that point on focuses on Marta trying to cover her tracks as Blanc slowly catches on that something else is going on here. Yeah. So it's really told from her point of view. So the audience is with her rooting for her to cover her tracks because she doesn't want the old man's money. This really was accidental. So you feel for her. So and she does a great job carrying this movie. Yeah, I, I, I think the second act flounders a little bit when you get into the car chase scene. I was just like that. One of the characters actually says this has to be the worst car chase ever. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because in the second act also is when the facts are coming at you. And this is when you're missing stuff. 
like in a lot of whodunits, you get this. It was him in the in the study with the candlestick, with the yeah. rope, with yeah. this, you know. So it's kind of hard to keep track of everything that's going on. So you kind of miss right. some things in the plot. Because what does happen, they go to read the will and they've all been cut out and he leaves everything to Marta. So then the shish hits the fan. The, the family loses their mind. They immediately want her to retract it and, and not accept it. Ransom just thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. Because he's already been cut out of the He's already been cut out, yeah. So he actually rescues her, and she tells him the whole story. She explains to him exactly what happens, and he says, you know what? I believe you, and I'm going to help. Now, this is the first signal that something is wrong, because this guy has been an a-hole from scene one that he's been in. I'm like, no, this is a little bit uncharacteristic of this character to suddenly, suddenly, altruistically suddenly want to help her. But, but you, you kind of think, well, he's already been cut out of the will. She now owns everything. If he accommodates her, maybe she'll give him some money back. So you, you feel he's got ulterior motives in that, in that regard, that he's, that he's looking to, you know, ingratiate himself to get some, <laughs> some right. of his inheritance back. Soon after she tells Chris Evans the whole story, she gets something in the mail, a cutout, a Xeroxed photocopy of the blood work from the autopsy on her grandfather. That's going to show that, she, that he died of a morphine overdose. Now, it doesn't say, what the blood work says no it's all it says head, is the yeah. header from the coroner's office yep. and a note on it writ handwritten i know what you did so now so she's freaking out yep you got family members walt hunts her down because now it's all over the news that he left this money to her so now she's on the run yeah and her and ransom decide well let's go to the courthouse or the toxicology report the and, coroner's and office right coroner's office what... yep and we're gonna get, we're gonna see there's got to be one copy there's got to be a copy, only to find it burnt to the ground. Daniel Craig is there. He sees their car parked uh, like right. a block they're, away. They're, they're, right? trying, they're trying their best to like just hunker down behind the dashboard, and that doesn't work too well. And so that's when the car chase starts, and the, she's got a terrible car that like doesn't go over 60 miles an she hour. Goes, are, so, are you regretting yeah. helping me? He goes, I'm <laughs> regretting we didn't take the Beamer. So from this point on, this is where it gets fast and furious, because Benoit has talked to the grandmother who claims that she saw Ransom climbing down the trellis. Now we know that she saw Marta climb down the trellis, right. but because she's so stuff. senile, she thought it was Ransom because she's obsessed with Ransom. For, you know, she's always saying, where is Ransom? Did Ransom leave? Is Ransom yeah. here? So everybody she pretty much sees as Ransom. So they've talked to her and they're convinced that Ransom did climb up the trellis. So they arrest him as soon as they both get out of Marta's Yeah, because they think that, that she's gonna get arrested. She now wants to get to this location where this note is telling her, oh, because it, she got an email with an address and a time. So now we're going to go and find out who's trying to blackmail her. Because she had brought this note from the coroner's office to Ransom. Like we said, they drove to the coroner's office and he's helping her out with this, trying to figure out who wrote her this note. And he says at one point, have they contacted you in any other way? And she's like, no. Right, yeah. Have you looked at your email? He's Right, yeah. Exa- yeah. Oh, hmm. No, I didn't look at my email. Yeah, this, this is where the movie kind of loses me a little bit because I got very far-fetched. She looks at her email and there's an email in there telling Marta that whoever is blackmailing her that they want to meet with Marta. Yep. So she goes to this location while Daniel Craig waits it's in the like car for her. In the car. She you goes. Just, she, uh, so it goes into this yeah. abandoned laundromat or whatever, and there's Fran, who is the housekeeper, sitting in this abandoned laundromat with a big black widow spider like on her eye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's actually she's not dead. She's been um, injected with morphine. Yeah, because Marta's bag, her medicine bag, went missing the night of the murder, and they just assumed that it got picked up during the. Uh, uh, investigation as right. far as evidence but there is her bag sitting sitting at her feet almost as marta is calling 911 and giving cpr to fran because she's been overdosed with morphine this is this is getting into the end game of this movie so after the ambulance comes and blanc knows that fran was in there and now she's off to the hospital marta actually confesses to him on their way back to the mansion what she did so now blanc knows that she accidentally killed Harlan Thrombey. But But Marta kind of has an idea as to where Fran, because it was Fran who went to the coroner's office and got that report and wrote that note on there saying, I know what you did. If Fran were to hide this complete toxicology report anywhere in the house, she knows where it would be because earlier on, Meg had had a little stash where she left her joints above the fireplace. So she figures that's where Fran was going to hide it because she knew about what Meg had in there. And sure enough, that's where the toxicology report is. 
the unedited toxicology report, I may add. So Blanc tells her, okay, you've got to tell them what you've told me, and then we'll work it well, out. Well, no, he's, he actually didn't want her to tell the family. She, he did, she, initially. She was she, about to, until he she read wanted, that report. She wanted to come clean, right. And then all of a sudden, yeah, he stops her, yeah. He's got the toxicology report, and he starts screaming, nope nothing wrong here. Look the other way. This was a suicide. And they're like, what? What's going on here? So up until this point, you're convinced that Marta has, you know, because you've seen it with your own eyes, that Marta yeah. killed him. And it was all an accident. And all this rigmarole about them trying well, to find another suspect. Him. She poisoned yeah. him and he killed himself to cover her up, to help right. to not put her away. So you know, as an audience member, that nobody else had any hands in doing this. Yeah. Until the end, it's revealed that the toxicology report comes back normal. That he what? Yes. Bam. This is the Sherlock Holmes moment of this movie where Blanc like, lays all of his cards on the table. And the one thing we didn't talk about, which is there's this beautiful set piece in this house where they're, they're conducting these interviews, which is this giant, I, I want to call it like a Game of Thrones, you know, the throne built out of swords. But it's just this beautiful set piece of just knives, knives and, and scabbards and all kinds of, you know, and it's all in a, in a cylindrical design. They're all pointed inward. You see it in the, in the promos for the, the movie itself. And uh, it's just a beautiful set piece. And it just plays up the idea of this knives out that everyone's looking to cover their own ass. And if they got to throw one of the family members under the bus, then so be it. But yeah, he does. He goes full on, you know, Ransom says foghorn leghorn and he's rolling up his sleeves and he's deducing it. And he goes into this crazy ass speech about everything, a, a donut hole. This is, this is the whole story, but there's a hole in the middle and we found the answer, but the, the answer is a donut hole, but it has a hole in it too. And you're just like, what the f- <laughs> it's like a donut in a donut hole that's got its own hole. I will say that, like I said, second act really kind of lost me, but this it totally redeemed itself in these closing moments. And, and it's largely due to Craig's, like he is hammy. He is just hamming this up. And Chris Evans, like he's so smug that it's just it, the two of them, it, it's, it's beautifully played out. It turns out that it was not Marta that killed Harlan, even though the events that played out are still true. What you saw, right. it doesn't Correct. take away from anything yeah. that you know already. But Chris Evans' character of Ransom, he set out after he knew that he was cut out of the will to frame Marta. Because he knows that she, she's being left everything. Harlan tells him no one's getting anything. It's all being left to her. Which is why he stormed out of the house yep. to begin with. Right. So he drives past the little elephant statue to get his yeah. way past the security cameras. He walks back to the house before Marta even has a chance to, after she thinks she's accidentally killed Harlan, goes upstairs into their attic room because he knows that Marta is going to give him his meds a little bit later on. Yeah. Switches the morphine and the, I forget what the regular medicine right, was whatever. called. He I switches the labels on the two bottles. But it is revealed that Marta is such a good nurse that she doesn't even need to look at the labels to know what she's given Harlan. Yeah, they, they was mentioned that the viscosity is slightly different the sli- between the Viscosity two. of the liquid is different, right. that, that Marta would able, be able to tell just by a cursory glance or yep. even lifting the bottles to know which is which. So, so in reality, she gave him exactly what she should have given him. D- despite the labels being switched. Correct, right. And he killed himself for nothing because he yes, would have survived. Yes, he would not have died. He yeah. would have survived. Which is crazy. That, that, that's, that was a nice little twist. Um, and it was, it was Fran who saw him do it. So she was trying to frame Ransom. And he, in turn, yes, took Fran that. Yes, not, not, didn't, see, didn't see Harlan cut his own throat, but <clears> saw <throat> Ransom switch the bottles. So when she wrote the note, I know what you did with the toxicology report. She was sending it to Ransom and not But see, that doesn't make any sense, though, because if the toxicology report came back clean. Well, here's the thing is here's what I think happened, that she saw the toxicology report come back clean, but she was blackmailing Ransom. She couldn't do it if she sent him the whole clean thing. So that's why she tore off the header. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just enough for him to thought that he. Yeah. yeah. So so he thought that she knew that the morphine was showing on in his blood level. So that's why she just used the header. And so then Ransom got that note and then forwarded it to Marta. It was a blackmail upon a blackmail upon a blackmail. Right. By the end of it. Right. So they're in the room and, and fingers are being pointed and uh, she gets a phone call and it's the hospital. 
because Brand Ransom is, says this is a great story, but you, you're yeah, never you going to no, make any of this stick. You've got no proof. Right. Yes. Thank, oh, thank you, doctor. We appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Fran's good. She's yeah. she's she's going to pull through and she's ready to talk. Fran is the only one that would be able to, to identify um, yeah. to identify that he switched the bottles. Yeah. So and, then he loses his mind and he and he just goes full on syndrome and he just reveals everything. You know, he, he monologues and he explains it all. And then it turns out Marta vomits as soon as he's done. <laughs> right. Because she lied. Monologue, because she, she lied. lied. Yep. The call was telling her that Fran died at the died. hospital. Ransom realizes he's been had. He grabs one of the knives off of that big Game of Thrones circular chair, goes to stab Marta with it, but realizes that half of those knives are stage knives. And so and what he's chosen is a yeah. retractable knife. So and Harland like, actually called that early. If you, there was a, a discussion that him and Marta had early on and he was dismissing Ransom. And, and he even said, he said he wouldn't know a, a real knife from a stage knife. They kind of gave it away that that's. So it turns out that Chris Evans is the guilty party here. So he is the one that actually yes. killed his grandfather, yeah. but not technically his grandfather still killed himself, but correct. I right. guess they could get him on attempted murder on two yes, counts right. now. Yeah. yeah. So now this is what I love about this movie is that it gives you all this information during the film. There's nothing just dropped on you at the end. You realize that any piece of info, including that knife, which you mentioned that the grandfather says that he's got mm -hmm. some stage knives in there. Right. Everything in there is telegraphed. So if you were to go back and watch this again. Yeah, you'd be able to figure it out. You were, you're told everything as a viewer that is revealed to you at the end of this movie. Yep. You just don't realize it. So yeah. I think that's all given to you. And that's kind of what they send up at the end of Murder by Death is that so many murder mysteries just yeah. bring in these random characters at the right, end. Right, that, and that's great. When we get into that, I love that because you know he's not only calling out the characters, but the writers who write yeah. this crap. And again, the, the one character that you hate the most is the one that yeah. has killed. You know, yep. The most obvious one is the one who does it in, yep. in Knives Out, who's Chris Evans' character. So yeah, at the end, the family's left out in the cold and she's standing on the balcony and she has his mug that says, my house, my rules, my coffee. Because it is her house. Right. She's inherited the house. house. She now owns everything. And we had a Frank Oz cameo. Yes, we did. And, and now his it, most unfuzziest. Voice now, this is ever. the thing, because if you remember American Werewolf in London, Mr. Kessler, Mr. Right. Kessler. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so he can change up his voice a little bit. Yeah, it did not sound anything like no. Grover uh, or Waka Yoda Waka. or Fozzie. So, yeah. uh, it wasn't as, the dialogue wasn't as clever as I, I thought it was going to be. Um, and it does, like I said, um, you know, some of these, some of these big name actors do kind of take a back seat because it is Marta's story. But uh, the, the scenes with the family together fighting was, was great. It was a lot of fun to watch this unfold. And like I said, the, the house itself is its own character. Beautiful, beautiful set piece. So. Definitely. I think, I, I think Michael Shannon might have been my favorite character. There you go. Yeah. Uh, not the Nazi uh, grandson. <laughs> the little... they didn't have enough of him they didn't no, have enough of no him. no you want that's the kid from uh from it right he's the the main oh kid. was it yeah okay i didn't pack catch up on that um did you know that daniel craig and, and anna de armis they're both going to be in the next bond movie yeah i overheard somebody chatting about that uh, as yeah. we were walking out of the theater and said you know that's the bond girl in the next bond movie oh okay she's young to be a Bond girl. Yeah, it's kind of creepy, uh, right? Yeah, well, I mean, they, they sh they sh they've they shied away from that kind of sexist Bond from the 70s, but uh, I did love the use of Gordon Lightfoot sundown at the in end the, of this movie. When they're in, in the, the restaurant, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because the, the, I mean, the lyrics, you know what? Sundown, you better take care. See something about sneaking up the stairs. You know? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, it all yeah. it all means something, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's a fun movie. It's definitely uh, a lot of fun. So like what said, kind of buckets second, would you uh, would I would you I would go, like I said, it, it really kind of started going off the rails in the second act, but but the, you know, Daniel Craig and, and Chris Evans really saved it for me in the end. i go three and a half. Really? I think yeah. I'd go four with this, Would actually. you go? Okay. I really enjoyed it. And of yeah. course, it was a big, it got a big round of applause at the end of the of movie course. when the credits rolled. Well, I watched this after Murder by Death, and that one you'll find out I have a higher regard for. So, see, I watched it uh, opposite. I saw okay. I watched Knives Out first, and then Murder by Death. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah. But let's go into. I, I thought I would 
just pull up something fun from the archives for our trip to the concession stand this week. Alrighty. So I wanted to pull something in that would tie in with our theme of mystery. So take a listen. He's here. My mystery date. It's mystery date. The thrilling new Milton Bradley game of romance and mystery that's just for you. And you. And you. And you. Mystery date. Will you be ready for swimming? Or a dance? When you open the door, will your mystery date be a dream or a dud? Oh! Fun and surprises. That's mystery date. Remember, Milton Bradley makes the best games in the world. So, girls, open the door for your mystery date. Get mystery date. to top off the evening with a treat from our snack bar. Still time if you hurry. Last call for refreshments, folks. Go right this second to get something good to eat and drink to enjoy now or during the rest of the show. The finest quality ingredients are in the fixings of the delicious foods you'll find waiting to tempt your appetite at the snack bar. Extra special good hamburgers, wonderful donuts, ice cold thirst quenching drinks. Pizza generously sliced, steaming hot, fresh coffee, ice cream, and many flavors. It's showtime, folks. Enjoy the show. Okay, we're back. And again, our classic feature this week is Murder by Death. Which 1976. was 1976. Which meant that it probably dropped on HBO in 77? 77, 78, yeah, I would say. I'm trying, I'm trying to put it into context because I know, uh, yeah, I, I've seen this movie way too many times. And after 77, I didn't, I didn't really have access to uh, HBO. So it would have been before Star Wars is my take yeah and again it's not like you were seeking this movie but it was just no but it was on so and this is a movie like i said i've seen it numerous times uh watching it this time i i laughed at every stupid sight gag and silly line of dialogue like it was the first time i'd ever seen it (laughs) now it's been a very long time for me i remembered watching this but i don't know it as well as you did because right. this is one of these movies where you could probably lip sync it right but this yeah is... there's so many i mean the dialogue is just delicious there's so much yeah. neil simon is just so you know, for me of his game. i found it funny as well just because it was fresh because i didn't remember half this stuff right so a few key things i did remember but some of the jokes that went over my head as a kid you know oh I got absolutely now, so, yeah yeah mm-hmm. I, I do remember as a kid at one point he goes i'm number one he goes ah oh, you look like number two to me and she's like what does he mean i'll tell you later it's <laughs> disgusting <laughs> <laughs> like just stupid stuff like that as a kid you're like number two me. Now, this was very much, I think, like in the in the mold of a young Frankenstein. Oh, absolutely. Where, or a Mel Brooks movie where he, he's completely spoofing the murder yeah, genre, this is the murder mystery up, genre. Right. Yeah. This is a straight up parody. You know, yeah. you're taking all these characters, what, like Agatha Christie and Charlie Chan, Sam Spade. You know, yeah. All these Mickey famous de- literary all detectives are sent up because the, the plot is, is that this uh, millionaire um, who is Lionel Twain, Played by Truman Capote in this Which movie. is weird, right? Yeah. I did read, right? I saw something that I guess not only did the director, but the, but the producers were trying to, to get him off this movie. Like he's a writer, right? He wrote yeah. Cold Blood. So how did, how did he get hired? And then how did they not want him? <laughs> well, he's not like the a, best actor. So No, but he's such a character. He is. He is such a character. And you can't have this. I don't think you could have this movie with any other person playing that, that role. Because he is so, I don't even know how to explain him. He's like androgynous almost. He's yeah. just a weird, he's got, um, yeah. Even as a kid, I was uncomfortable with him. <laughs> yeah, his, manner, like, his mannerisms are very bizarre and it kind of yeah. feeds the character that he needs to be playing. Right. So um, this Lionel Twain gathers all these famous detectives and they're all... Uh, spoofs of literary detectives. Yeah. So Milo Perrier, based on Hercule Poirot, Heck yeah. 
uh, Jessica Marbles based on Miss Marple. Sydney Wang, oh, this Chan. is a grown, based on Charlie Chan, played <laughs> in a role that you would never, ever get away with today. No, no. Um, it, it, and the, the, the dialogue. Peter that, Sellers, you know, playing yes. this character of Sydney this Wang. Asian, uh, using oh, every. Oh, number two son. Every uh, stereotype like, at yes. his. <laughs> So funny. <laughs> Every time he speaks, a gong goes off in the background. So uh, I was very guiltily laughing at what he was. Oh, uh, see, I I know it's it, it's a product of its time, and it yeah, is. you're right. It would never get a, you could never get away with this now. It's uh, like Mickey Rooney in uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, you know. <laughs> but it's just so funny, and he's just constantly throwing out those Confucius uh, little uh, isms, uh, you know, like like. Questions like, like athlete's foot. A, Questions right. like athlete's foot. <laughs> After a while, very irritating. <laughs> yes, right. Like television at honeymoon, unnecessary. <laughs> so we get Sam Diamond, who is right. based on Sam Spade. So it's Peter Falk playing Humphrey Bogart, who played Sam Spade in the Maltese Falcon, which is yeah. But funny. he was doing Columbo at the time too. He was so doing he wasn't Columbo really, too. So was this say, wasn't so he wasn't him. really no. He was you know right down to the trench coat. He, then you got Dick and Dora Charleston, who were based on Nick and Nora Charles, another literary detective team, a husband and wife team, played by David Niven and Eileen Brennan of Eileen uh, Brennan. Private Benjamin. So we got the setup now. So all these characters are converging on this mansion because yes. they've got sent an invitation saying, come for a dinner and a murder. Yeah. So they all show up. They're like, yeah, okay. But, uh, have, but, but, we, but there's no yeah. murder taking place. So they assume that, of course, it's going to be Lionel Twain. That's, they've all figured out this murder from the get-go because who else could it be but Lionel Twain who sent the invite that's going to be the right. murderer? This is like the original murder mystery uh, dinner party. Yeah, it is. You know, it where is. you go to people. Uh, but we didn't, you didn't mention Alec Guinness. Yes. Who is my Obi -Wan himself favorite yeah. character in this movie. He plays Benson Mum. And there's so many, like, like just... Like I said, the dialogue is just so rat a tat, and like I can't even explain it. But he is friggin' genius in this role, and you can see he's just having a grand old time. He's blind; he's a blind butler, and those sight gags just tickle me. <laughs> never, they're stupid. There's a whole thing because you bring in Nancy Walker, who is uh, she's m m mute, right? She can't talk, so right? She can't so, hear him, and yeah, she can't. So the, and, the, and he, she's brought in to be the the kitchen mate. She's supposed to cook them dinner. The conversation between the two is just silly. It's so over the top, but it just it makes me laugh. And right, the very first sight gag when he's putting the stamps on the letters to mail them out to the to, to each respective uh, um, inspector Clouseau's and all these guys. You know, and he's licking them, and you hear him stamping on the ground, and then you look, and all the stamps are on the table, and he didn't hit a single envelope. Just stupid stuff like that. You know, my favorite line in this movie is because that um, the deaf and dumb cook could not hear her instructions on what to cook. She didn't cook anything. Right. So Alec Guinness at one point brings out soup, and there's the nothing soup. in the soup bowl. <laughs> so one of the characters at one point after they realize they have no soup, says is there someone in the kitchen with dinner instead of right. is there someone in the kitchen <laughs> with dinah yeah. <laughs> and inspector pierre like i guess we couldn't get that was james coco right yes yeah yes. we couldn't get dom de we couldn't get dom de right. no <laughs> we got james coco and listen he does a damn good job but all he wants to do is eat through this whole movie he's yep, pissed yep. that there's no food oh my god and it, and he's uh french so at yes. one point when he's talking to the butler he's like nespa and he goes, I'm sorry, sir. I don't think we have any Nespa. <laughs> no, he's not French, actually, because well, he says Sam Diamond calls him Frenchy at one point. He says, I am not the Frenchy. I I'm know, a Belgian. But, but then I think he contradicts it by saying something about being French. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. but that's uh, Alec Guinness. He was actually reading the script for Star Wars in between uh, filming of this. Really? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, because he is in prime Obi-Wan Kenobi shape, if if you yeah. want to see Obi Wan in a comedy, this is your this is your and this movie. Is, and and at the end of this movie, he's brilliant because they've all deduced who who he really is, and he keeps changing his characters. At one point, he even becomes a woman. The victim here is Lionel Twain himself, yes. because as Truman Capote, who's kind of 
got the voice of like a female Winnie the Pooh. Almost. Right. <laughs> Great analogy. He ends up at midnight being the murder victim because he's got. A, he shows up with a knife in his back. Well, he tells him exactly what's going to happen. Midnight, someone's going to get stabbed twenty times or whatever, twelve times, and so they're like, "Oh, we got to stick together." And then, of course, you know, they get pulled apart. Yeah, and, events lead them to be pulled apart. Or the, the picture that the sight gag of the, of the of the painting of the dog, and as they're walking down the stairs, he sticks his tongue out. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that this really is asking to be held up under scrutiny as Knives Out should be because no. this is just all over the place because as these world famous detectives are each in turn solving this mystery, they're one upping each other because they realize that it is the butler that did it. So Alec Guinness is not only the murderer, but nobody's been murdered. He is Lionel Twain himself. As each detective is solving this case, they, they, uh, they in turn realize that it's not Lionel Twain, that it's the butler himself who's gotten everybody here. Then it turns out that the butler is a woman, then the butler's not a woman, the butler's not blind. And right. so they're all giving these revelations uh, until it turns out that it is, in fact, the deaf mute cook that is Yetta. Lionel Twain at the yeah. end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she was known what Nancy Walker. She was like the bounty lady. She was the bounty picker upper lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty years that those ads ran for. Really? So, and we didn't mention James Cromwell's first movie. Yes. Uh, I will point out the fact that I think that this entire cast is dead now, except for Maggie Smith and Cromwell. Well, Maggie Smith, I don't think will ever die. She is just <laughs> going to continue to get older and yeah. older. But she looks pretty good. Yeah, she looks yeah. pretty damn good in this movie. Yeah, she does. If the all you know her from is Harry Potter, then you should take. Well, a look that's at this. What I was going to say that's pretty much all you know from it nowadays. But the uh, the doorbell that was a woman scream. Do you know yes. the significance of that? No. Fay Ray from King Kong. Really? Yep. So that's a running gag that every time the doorbell rings, it's it's a scream. I was going to bring up the set design for this was pretty well put together because this was all soundstage, this entire house that they built. But then I saw Knives Out and that house puts this one to shame. But for the production time at the you know at the time it was it was pretty brilliant. Yeah, and I, I think most of that budget probably went into the lowering ceiling in uh, yeah right in the, room. Yeah, because at one point they're all they're all uh, attacked, whether it's by a snake or a, a scorpion. They did all kind of realize that they had motives to take out Twain, and at one point uh, it was revealed that that Sam Diamond. Had his girlfriend who was constantly hitting on him and he wanted nothing to yeah. do with her she goes twain picked up sam at a gay bar he goes i was undercover she goes five nights a week for six months <laughs> <laughs> so this is just it just yeah it tickles my funny bone we didn't point out yet playing jessica marbles is elsa lanchester the bride of frankenstein herself oh i did not know that yeah cool very very short i Remember yes. the Bride of Frankenstein being, being taller, very, but it's, it was the Mark the hair. hair, right? Yeah. The, the hair. You saw the opening credits, the, the animation. That was uh, Charles Adams from yes. the Adams Family did those illustrations. And they also used those in the movie poster as well. Which is a great movie poster. Yes. A very memorable image. Yep. So hopefully you'll be able to pull that for our uh, Instagram. Yeah. Right? Uh, the end scene where Twain, you, you kind of brought this up a little bit, where, where Twain is uh, calling out all the characters for their ridiculous, you know, you, you, you bring in a new character in the last five pages, you know, you deliberately hide clues that, that, that cause us to not be able to solve the mystery as a reader or as a, as a, someone who watches it. All I could think of was in it chapter two, when they kept calling out McAvoy's character for sloppy endings. Yes. As a, as kind of a call out to King. I felt that that was like a little slap at the end. They're like, so was there a murder or not pop? And he goes, yes. Killed good weekend. <laughs> <laughs> now there's also a deleted scene that i remember so i don't know how this is they only show it in the televised version it wasn't in the director's cut and it wasn't in the theatrical version but if they show it on tv i guess the scene at the very end when they're all driving away from the house sherlock holmes and watson drive up so you remember this scene I, as I, being incorporated in the movie when I read this, I'm like, I remember that. And then it wasn't, so I don't know if I had, because like I said, I know like 99% accuracy that I've seen this on HBO. I don't remember ever watching it on regular television. And reportedly they cut that because the actors, the main actors felt that that scene upstaged their characters. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all righty so there's a little go. throwaway cameo so okay so this was again released june 1976 so it was a summer movie 
did very well at the box office. 32 million it made. So which is, I think, in terms of 70s dollars, that's pretty damn good. Pretty 32 good. million dollars. Yeah. yeah. And again, Jeff, you've got the emotional connection to this one. Yeah. So I'm guessing that you're going to rate this pretty high. Uh, at least four and a quarter. Yeah. Four and a quarter, really. Four and a quarter. This this just tickles my fun. And like I said, watching it again, and I even caught my wife laughing at some of the jokes because they're out there. And like you said, you know, Peter Sellers is just straight up stereotype. Yeah. But you mm-hmm. can't help. You just got to take it in the context of when it was made. Right. Um, I, I I wasn't uh, ashamed that I was laughing. <laughs> Right. It wasn't like, you know, sitting in the theater watching Jojo Rabbit, but it is, it just, you know, there's so many, not just sight gags, but like you said, it is kind of, you know, Frank, young Frankenstein kind of riding the coattails a little bit, but this is really kind of tongue in cheek and, mm-hmm. and the dialogue is. is yeah. And it's very silly. It's, it's silly it humor, but it is fun, but it is yeah. fun. So I'd go probably three and a quarter. I okay. think you see this was one that I saw as a kid but I never you know had huge exposure to it so right. I didn't see it many many times I saw it once or twice but you know always on my radar so yeah I had fun yeah. watching it so I, I am going to give a shout out to my friend uh, David O'Brien who uh, he has a show called Matinee Minutia and they just covered this like a, about a month or so ago so it really kind of brought it back up under my radar oh really okay yeah so they they tend to live stream on discord but you can watch the episodes on or listen to the episodes on the, their website uh, matinee minutia i think it's uh, wordpress.com okay but uh go. so yeah that that kind of brought it back up and i thought it was a perfect pairing and like i said i saw this i watched this before i watched knives out so, you know, just loving the dialogue, I was kind of let down a little bit with uh, with Knives Out that it, it didn't have that kind of rat-a-tat. Yeah, with the exception much. of uh, Daniel Craig, who oh, yeah. brought oh, it all, especially just, at yeah. the end of that. You're like one step away from, bleep, 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 <laughs> that's all, folks. Our confessional this week. Confessional. We were thinking um, in terms of the murder mystery genre. Jeff, now I know what my answer is going to be, but do you tend in any movie, because ever since The Sixth Sense, there is kind of a seemingly, seemingly like an obligation for filmmakers to provide some kind of a twist ending, regardless of the genre. Romantic comedies do it. Sci-fi does it. Horror yeah. definitely does it. I mean, how can you not? Especially if you're a fan of movies, you really, yeah, you want to be one step ahead. And that's, you know, again, go back to uh, Murder by Death, where, where Twain is calling out these writers for this hackneyed endings and sometimes you get that crap where all of a sudden you get this like you said knives out everything's laid out for you yeah and i just and again i love the fact the biggest jerk of the movie whom in any other movie would be the red herring who would not be the one to do it does it it. knives out so it's like the anti-twist almost you know sixth sense is a good right because once you see it you can't once you know the twist ending then the movie kind of falls apart but but go to like fight club where you get to the twist ending and now all of a sudden you're like, I, I got to go back and watch that movie again. Yeah. Because now I want to see it knowing what I know. And it's a completely different experience. It's yeah. not like it's yeah. ruined for you. It's Correct. a different it's movie. It's a different movie. Yeah. yeah. Memento. Memento. Oh, Nolan so, just. So yeah. So that leads so, to the yeah, question. You... That leads to the question. Do you go into a movie now looking to figure out the ending before it actually happens uh, during the course an, of the an, movie if it's an m night Shyamalan movie yes yes because yes. you feel you have you feel it's coming and you want to one-up him and you want to be you want to one-up him um yeah. yeah but listen my my super sleuth deductive skills are all you know based on uh, velma dinkley from scooby-doo <laughs> <laughs> and it's true i would it's be true. a pissed i would be a piss poor uh detective because uh, now here's the thing with knives out those same girls that i complained about who were ooing and eyeing over Chris Evans. Right. They did something interesting. They all sat down for Knives Out. Obviously, they've seen the trailer, so they know who's in this movie. Mm-hmm. Each one of them had a guess for as to who did it at the end of okay. the movie. One all of them right. was like Jamie Lee Curtis. It's got to be Jamie Lee Curtis. She had no motive. Another one was like, the one who was the, the biggest ooh and ah over Chris Evans. Like, oh, it's Chris Evans. It's got to be Chris <laughs> Evans. If he's in this movie... <laughs> He's got to be the bad guy. So they each had a different character that they That's were rooting funny. for. I like that, though. So because of that, it was on my mind. But generally, I just like to sit back and let the movie happen to me. Let I don't want to think too hard. I don't want to yeah. think too hard. I find myself, if I'm thinking about what's going to be happening, I'm missing You're missing. You're missing. Yeah. yeah. Of yep. what they're trying to tell me. So yep. I make an attempt not and just let the director have his way with it. <laughs> Use and abuse me. Is yes, yes. The kind of guy you are. 
So yeah. yeah. So I tend not to. I, I don't try to look for the for the surprise. Yeah, I guess I'm always trying to be the smart guy, call it out beforehand. Yeah. I sometimes like to tell people, oh, I knew I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, after the fact. After I saw it coming yeah. a mile away. <laughs> Boy. That was fun. I enjoyed Knives Out. I yeah, enjoyed, definitely yeah. enjoyed Murder uh, by Death. It was a great two weeks for for movie at Jojo Rabbit and now yeah. Knives Out. Yeah, yeah, and now we're coming up to a lull. So that leads us into what we're gonna do next week. Christmas is right around the corner, so we sucks. figured we've already beaten to death the idea of the Christmas special. For this episode, we were gonna bring up what each of our favorite Christmas movies are. Yes. And thought we would unleash them on you. Now, Jeff is not really sure what he's going to do yet. So I think that we're going to hold off on telling you. I think we will you. hold off. Yeah. Let you, you know, because there's plenty out there. Yeah, You there got is. classics and you got newer stuff. Yeah. Just because it only came out two years ago. So doesn't, now doesn't... we really, we're going to tell each other at some point this week, just so we can watch oh, each other's we movies. Have to. But we won't share it with you. So you'll have to come back and listen to figure out what our picks right. are. Yes. I like so, it. And in just two weeks, Rise of Skywalker. So stay tuned. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. And we have the Mandalorian episodes. If you're not watching that, or if you are watching that, don't listen to it if you're not watching the show, because we yeah. do spoil. If you don't want to spend, you know, an hour, an hour and a half like you normally do with us, just an 18, 20 minute, <laughs> then like my then wife, those are for you. She's going to take me in small doses. <laughs> so hope you enjoy it. Yes. Always Another a pleasure. Of TMI. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Mr. Kessler. Mr. Right. Kessler. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>